our um, this press conference is being filmed this morning, so uh, I believe it will also be placed online. Um, if you'll one moment. All right, so we are going to hear from a number of speakers, um, a couple of folks that have been working on amicus briefs, but primarily uh, we're here to hear from families and folks impacted by um, the Department of Corrections and hear from folks who have been incarcerated. I just wanted to first open us up by giving us a bit of a, a much bigger picture. Um, I have been working as representation for Surge Reproductive Justice and Community Passageways um, in partnership with other attorneys and the COVID-19 Mutual Aid Seattle on an amicus brief that is going to go before the Washington State Supreme Court. Um, and the goal of this uh, brief is to speak specifically to the voices of families and those that are impacted by by COVID-19, by its effect in, in the Department of Corrections and the ways in which it exasperates the pre-existing condition of mass incarceration and the inequities within the healthcare system um, and the inequities faced by family members of loved ones that are incarcerated in that system. So the, the, the first person we're gonna hear from uh, is going to be Nick Allen from Columbia Legal Services so that he can break down a little bit for us of where this suit started and uh, where we're at right now. Yeah, thanks, Nikita. Um, and I'm sorry um, in advance that I can only uh, stay for a few minutes here to, um, to give an update on the, on the case and um, latest developments. Um, I thought what I would speak to is, uh, you know, yesterday's proclamation and uh, commutation order that were entered by the governor, and then also give uh, an update on where we're at with the case. Um, you know, we, we acknowledge that the, the governor's taken a step to reduce the prison population in light of the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, yesterday at his press conference, uh, but only after weeks of pressure by the community, uh, a lawsuit, an outbreak at one of the prisons, and being by, uh, ordered by the court, um, quote, uh, to immediately exercise uh, their authority to take all necessary steps to protect the health and safety of the main petitioners and all Department of Corrections inmates in response to the COVID-19 out outbreak, um, they finally admit that relief is a necessary measure uh, for mitigating the risks uh, uh, of harm to people in prison that are posed uh, by this virus. And, uh, and sign the, the proclamation and, and commutation order. Like I said, while we acknowledge that this is a, a first step at release, we don't believe that this um, that this order goes far enough. Um, it's vague. It reports that somewhere between 600 and 950 people uh, will be released uh, from prison. But it doesn't explain the basis for those releases, uh, such as scientific or public health health basis. For releasing this number of people and how this this number of releases will allow for appropriate social distancing within the prisons uh, so as not to allow for further outbreaks. Um, it's really limited with regards to who's eligible for release and as a result doesn't specifically address our of vulnerable populations as we've uh, 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 commonly stated you know those over 50 and those with underlying health conditions um, it doesn't speak to equitable considerations that have to be taken into account related to relief. Um, we don't want to see release plans uh, end up occurring and having them mirror current uh, racial and ethnic disparities that exist within our uh, prison system uh, currently. And it doesn't provide much in terms of next steps. Um, the only thing we don't see to explore other avenues for release. Um, but as uh, 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 community and others have argued for, you know, the last several weeks, um, widespread release is, um, is necessary in order to uh, uh, allow for appropriate social distancing within the prisons 
and therefore um, protect those uh, in those uh, in those facilities. As for the case, um, we have a reply that's due to the respond uh, a reply to the respondent's uh, response brief that's due this afternoon. Uh, that's in support of the underlying petition. Uh, as uh, uh, Nikita spoke to the um, uh, uh, amicus brief that's being submitted, all other amici have to file their briefs of amici curiae um, by today. And um, my understanding is that there will be several, I think at least uh, eight or nine, uh, both in support of the um, petitioners and respondents. Um, and then um, on top of that, there's this underlying uh, emergency motion that we filed uh, earlier this week and the uh, state has to uh, file their answer to uh, that motion uh, to amend um, uh, that we filed on Monday. Uh, tomorrow, the governor and DOC have to file their updated report uh, on the steps they have taken in their implementation plan uh, for the steps that were outlined in the initial report that they provided to the court uh, pursuant to the court orders, uh, court order from last week. And then next week uh, on the 23rd at 9 a.m., uh, oral argument is scheduled before the uh, state Supreme Court on the petition. Um, it is going to be uh, just like this uh, press conference here. It'll be by uh, Zoom and it'll be live streamed uh, via uh, TVW. Uh, like I mentioned, uh, I have to um, take off, uh, but CLS will be providing a more detailed briefing on the on the legal matters uh, in the case uh, sometime uh, in the next week. And, uh, and I'd also be happy to respond to any questions um, uh, by email. I can put my email uh, in, the, um, in the chat box here and if uh, folks have questions, I'm happy to respond. But, um, but thanks for the time, uh, Nikita, and um, uh, just thanks to all of the, the great efforts uh, that are taking place um, in the community uh, to raise awareness about the, uh, the harms that are, that are being caused, uh, inflicted upon people in the prisons and the steps that need to be taken in order to, um, in order to ensure that, that future outbreaks are not happening and, um, and, and folks in prisons are being protected just like uh, the rest of us uh, here in the community. Thank you, Nick. Uh, we appreciate your time. I wanted to give a little more context for the amicus brief that was written on the, from a community perspective and really focusing on the experience and impact on families. While the state has implemented social distancing measures to protect the public at large from COVID-19, there have not been comparable efforts to protect our loved ones in prisons and jails. Many incarcerated persons continue to not have access to sanitary and protective equipment, such as hand soap, hand sanitizer, and masks. Uh, and these things would help slow the spread of COVID-19 um, inside of prisons as we've seen it help slow the spread of COVID-19 inside of prison or outside of prisons. Uh, we've heard from the state that they believe they've already provi provided the appropriate relief to our loved ones and yet uh, reality is they have lacked transparency and accountability with us regarding the protection and safety of our loved ones and ultimately the release of some of our loved ones. Um, knowing that decreasing how many folks are incarcerated is the best method for preventing outbreaks and spread of COVID-19 within the prison system. Recent accounts from families and loved ones speak deeply to the concerns, the grave concerns um, that are shared by many both inside and outside of prisons. And these accounts reveal that the Department of Corrections and the governor have not done enough to respond to the threat of COVID-19 inside of the state's prisons and jails. And so I wanted to share with you first a few stories um, that will be incorporated in the brief. The first is uh, Diana, who has a loved one at Washington Correction Center says, my son has been in Shelton since, March, since late March. When he first got there, he was in solitary confinement. 
Then they moved him to the intensive management unit. He was placed in a room by himself in the same medical unit where they were taking people suspected of having COVID-19. The nurse told him it wasn't airborne, but all of the nurses around him were wearing hazmat suits. He was in that unit with no protection for over a week and a half, then finally moved to the restitution center where he was with a hundred other people and a roommate who sleeps in the same room. He said they do not have masks, they do not have protection. COVID has been in there and for a long time, the DOC wasn't telling the truth about it. <clears throat> and a story from another parent. Inmates are not good at reporting illnesses because history has shown that if they report an illness or show they're sick or not feeling well, they're put in the hole. My son's cellmate had this happen to him. He was put in the hole for two days and given no food. So later when my son came down with the flu, he didn't report it because he didn't want to be segregated. He didn't want his food and belongings taken away. Unless you're really sick, you don't report because you don't want the ramifications. And this story really points to how many, how many of our loved ones um, instead of receiving treatment and compassionate care or being placed in solitary confinement, uh, a practice which we know is both psychologically and physiologically damaging and is recognized by many to be torture. My son works in a textile factory, factory making masks and gowns. There's no social distancing practiced in the clean room, which is where the workers strip down and change from their prison clothes and into their work clothes. He said they're packed in like sardines. My son calls it a sweatshop. He's grateful to have a job, but he works eight and a half hours a day and makes 70 cents per an hour and then can't shower after work. This is the mother of a loved one at Coyote Ridge Correction Center. Recognizing that the, those on the inside are being conscripted to make personal protective equipment, but as you heard earlier, many of them are not even able to receive that same personal protective equipment that their labor is being used to make. Another parent says, if this epidemic continues, it would cause a financial burden for us. My daughter-in-law is out of work and my husband and I had to close our non-essential business. We'll pitch in and do what we can. We want to stay in contact with our son, but on a longer term basis, I'm not sure we could sustain the cost. In, in normal times, in a non-pandemic time, families spend uh, massive amounts of their income supporting their loved ones who are incarcerated, um, especially on communication. And studies show that some families will go into debt to be able to communicate with their loved ones. As you heard earlier, some of our loved ones are being placed in solitary confinement. They're being denied their belongings. So even in instances where families are spending mass amounts of their income to stay in communication with their loved one, they may not even be able to access them because that person has not been allowed access to their tablet or to JPay. Lastly, I wanna share a story about the children of incarcerated peoples. I think we often forget that there are young people who miss their parents, uh, miss their family. And in this time when so many young people are not in school, when they're at home, our incarcerated loved ones could be a very key support system for helping sustain childcare and education of our, of our children. Working with our son's eight-year-old daughter through this journey has been so hard. When he first went away, we were talking with her, making sure she got counseling to process what was going on. Now she's terrified and afraid her dad's life, and we're going to have to go through a process all over again. For an eight-year-old to have to feel that way, there are no words we can use to comfort her. Every day she's worried about her dad. She wants him to come home because she knows he's not safe in prison. How do you comfort an eight-year-old who knows how deadly this virus is? It's hard to explain COVID-19 to kids in the first place, but with the added burden of talking about prison conditions, it's impossible. Uh, and this is the parent of a loved one who has someone in Washington Correction Center. Uh, what I really believe this brief emphasizes and reveals that there are families, uh, there are children, there are parents, and there are partners of incarcerated loved ones who are also feeling the trauma and the burden that COVID-19 is bringing and the ways in which it exasperates the pre-existing uh, conditions of mass incarceration and inequity in our society. And as a body, COVID-19 Mutual Aid Seattle and the other Amici on the brief, we believe that it is key for the state, for the Department of Corrections, for Governor Ensley to make significant efforts to reduce the numbers of people in prison and to ensure 
that until that release happens, people receive compassionate care, they receive personal protective equipment, and they're treated on the basis of their human dignity. So we wanted to ensure that families and formerly incarcerated uh, community members have the opportunity to speak because their voices and their knowledge are essential to ensuring that we achieve a solution that really does care for our whole community. Uh, the first family member we'll hear from is Cassandra Butler. Uh, good morning. My name is Cassandra Butler. I am um, a family member of an incarcerated individual. Um, he's been incar incarcerated for um, a pretty long time. So I have been involved in organizing surrounding um, prison systems for a long time. Um, so I want to touch on just a few things that Nikita has already touched on. And um, the first is that mass incarceration is not a secret. It's been a problem in this country long before COVID-19. It'll be a problem in this country long after. Um, many of us on this phone call have been fighting this mass incarceration systems and the laws designed to incarcerate people for um, long periods of time, uh, for a very long time. So the reason that's important to understand is because you'll hear uh, Secretary Sinclair get on the television and say, um, we are social distancing, we're practicing social distancing, we're ensuring it's being practiced, and the reality is it's not possible. Prisons have been overcrowded uh, for years and years and years. They did not all of a sudden stop being overcrowded because COVID-19. So there is no room. There was no room before, there is no room now. Um, the other thing that I think it's important to highlight is not only are they unable to social distance, but there is not efforts being made on the parts of folks that are working inside of there to social distance themselves. So what's happening is punitive measures are being taken. Um, incarcerated individuals who are not social distancing themselves, which is impossible, are being sent to the hole. Um, they're being uh, not able to use the phone. They're not allowed out of their cells. If they're in single person cells, they're being locked down. My brother, for instance, um, has been on lockdown almost this entire time. Um, he is let out once, sometimes twice a day. And at that moment has to choose which family member he's going to call. He has to choose between his parents, his siblings, his partner, his children, because there's not enough time to call all of them. Because in addition to being locked down, the number of phones that folks are able to use have been cut um, in the name of social distancing. So the only thing that has happened, um, like you're gonna hear from many folks, is that people are afraid now to talk about their symptoms because there is nowhere to social distance and the punitive measures that are being taken are cutting them off from their loved ones. I'm sure you all were um, present or most of you were present for the press conference where Governor Inslee and Stephen Sinclair also said that incarcerated individuals are not cooperating with social distancing and that they are doing everything they can, but that they are not wanting to give up their um, the, per the perks that they have in there. Um, that is not factual. They don't want to be cut off from their families. Something as simple as a JPay player, which to most people might seem like entertainment, is the only form of communication that some people inside have. If you cut off that communication, how will we know? If my brother does not have his JPay player, how will I know if something happens to him? He can't call me, he can't get to a phone, he is under the control of DOC as far as when he can even get out of his cell. So if you take that player from him, then how will I know he's okay? They certainly do not tell you. You can't call and get connected to a unit where somebody's going to tell you the status of your loved one. So the things that are being presented in the community, I want, or I want you all to know are not factual. Um, community members, we have loved ones in there. We are talking to our loved ones on a daily basis. And despite what Department of Corrections might try to say, everyone who's incarcerated is not lying about the conditions of their incarceration. These are factual statements. They are not being protected. The governor has locked the rest of the, the state down. We're supposed to wash our hands. We can't, we're not supposed to go out without a mask, all of these things, but somehow the thousands and thousands of human beings that the Department of Corrections is caging are less than human and should, are, are not afforded the same opportunities. That is absolutely inexcusable and will not be accepted by the loved ones of the incarcerated individuals inside. Thank you. 
Thank you, Cassandra. Next, we will hear, hear from uh, Twyla Kill, and she will speak specifically to the experience of her loved one. Hi, hi, Nikita. Thank you. Actually, um, I kind of switched up a little bit. I want to I want to tell a quick story that I think ties a lot of what's been talked about together. And I want to put the name Todd Sloan out there as his mother should be listening to this call. She uh, asked me to speak about him. Um, he's set for work release on May 12th with a release date of November 12th. And he's being held on drug related charges. He has Crohn's and ulcerative colitis. So both upper and lower intestines are compromised. He takes Remicade, which is an immune suppressive medication. He's 28 years old. In the past two years, he's been taken out of the prison to the public hospital 11 times to treat his ongoing conditions. In the last six months, he has lost 60 pounds. The last time his mother spoke with him was the 3rd of April. And on that call, he was crying, telling her, I can't get this disease, mom. If I get this, I'll die, it will kill me. That's very difficult for a mother to hear. That was the afternoon of the third, but prior to that, at 2 a.m. on the third, they did temperature checks and pulled five guys out of a unit, and he was one of them. And later that afternoon was the last call that she got. He stated that he was not given his property, which there are three major issues with that. He, needed, he needs added protein in his diet due to the weight loss, and the food that he keeps was in his property. Some of the medications that he needs to treat these conditions were also in there, as well as his shampoo and other cleaning, you know, hygiene stuff, which he never even got his two bars of soap. So in addition to that, he's also prescribed three insurers a day and told her he wasn't getting them. His mother told me that she found out that he tested positive on the news. It was not until yesterday, the 15th of April. So that's 12 days later that she received a call from DOC, um, from, from Commander Flick, to tell her that her son was in isolation and tested positive for COVID-19. She's like, yeah, I knew that a week ago. She was talking to um, Captain McNeese, who told her that they were going to get a roll cart phone to the positive inmates in isolation, and that they were waiting on Hepistat to clean the phone in between, in between calls, that they would get to call on Monday. So they promised this to the inmates and the families, and it never happened. And when she got that call yesterday, she asked him why that never happened. He said, well, that was last Friday. A lot's changed since then. And, um, and that was it. And this is happening right now. He said he's in the hole. It's cold. His water is brown. He has no cleaning supplies, not his medication, none of his property, which includes his JPay tablet. So she's had absolutely no communication with him. And she wants to stress that she does not feel Department of Corrections is capable of the type of medical treatment that her son needs right now, life-saving medical treatment. All she wants, you know, he's actually, I believe, qualified under this gray area, I mean, criteria that's been <laughs> given out here um, to be released. And she would like to take him to the hospital. She would like that release to take place now. It's been, a, oh, you know, they talked about releases on Monday. It, we're already looking at Thursday, you know. Um, why is he still in there? Why is he not in the hospital? And what has happened, you know, I say this story because this is the, all of our biggest fears. Those of us with compromised loved ones that are inside in Monroe, I miss you. Okay, this is my fear for my husband. He has a compromised liver. You take him away and lock him in the hole, I won't know if he's breathing. We just want to know if they're breathing, you know? It's not a lot to ask. And taking away all of the communications to the outside world also takes away Department of Corrections accountability, and that is not okay. They need to be accountable. We need to know what's happening real time. Um, I also want to know what you're going to do about those who, you know, what's going to happen to those who are qualified for release that um, that are already in the hole. You know, we want to know what's going to happen to them. Um, because um, I like I personally, I've been researching the CDC guidelines and um, I know how to quarantine my husband in my own home, even though I have a compromised lung. I have I have blessed with an extra bedroom bathroom on either side and I and I know those those qualifications. It's, 
you know, it can be printed up and handed out. It's a simple thing to families or posted on the, on the website when you're doing releases, how these families can do home care because we want the right to monitor our loved ones and call 911 if they need an ambulance. We want to know that somebody's there to call 911 if they can't breathe. We want to know that somebody believes them when they say they can't breathe. Officers, I don't trust the officers to believe my husband if he says I can't breathe. I don't trust them to care. <laughs> I don't think they're trained for that. This disease is not something we expected. The, the training isn't there. The medical expertise is certainly not there. And how are you medically monitoring these people in the hole? The hole is not a medical facility. It's a it's torture chamber for people that are under disciplinary action. It is not a medical ward at all. They should be in the hospital. None of this is okay. And we're terrified. And this is why. And I just want to say Todd Sloan and I want to put a real face, I mean a real name to that fear. And I want to speak for his mother. Um, also, I want to say that 600 to 950 people is absolutely not enough. That's at worst 50 people per prison for 12 prisons. What is that going to do? That's not even going to be noticeable. And it's not going to provide social distancing anywhere. So I guess uh, I thank you. Thank you for letting me speak. Thank you, Twyla. Uh, appreciate you bringing to the forefront Todd's name and uh, Todd's mom's story. It's really important for us to know that there are real people, uh, real lives uh, experiencing this terror firsthand. Our next speaker um, is Jenny Par Parham, and uh, she's also going to share about her experience and her loved one. Thank you, Nikita, for co-hosting. Uh, my name is Jenny Parham, and I am an incarcerated family member. Uh, my son has been in prison for 23 years. Uh, the, the men at Cedar Creek Camp, where my son is being housed right now, had about four things they wanted to share with everybody. The first thing is, in an attempt to social distance, the staff at Cedar Creek opened up the T building, which is a staff workout building. They opened up this building by placing cots on the floor. The men only sleep in there at night. There's no showers, no toilets. During the day, they still closely mingle with each other. The men wanted to make a clear mess, say, send a clear message that it is impossible to social distance in prison and placing cots in the T building where men only go at night is not an efficient step for social distancing and staff is still not social distancing. The second thing they wanted to share is there was a confirmed case at, of COVID at Cedar Creek, but staff took the man out of Cedar Creek and no one ever saw him again. It was all kept very secret. Third thing they shared is that they still do not have proper cleaning supplies. The, the men were given one bar of soap and coffee filters for masks. The last thing they wanted to share is that the men are concerned with the, the governor's violent, nonviolent language. Everybody in camp is already going home, so why would the governor risk their lives? Regardless of their crime or crimes, they have release plans and are on their way out already. COVID-19 could be a death sentence for those men if they were to get ill. The governor said in a news conference that he cannot save everybody on the boat. The men in Cedar Creek have an ask of the Supreme Court. And here's what they had to say. If Governor Inslee cannot save everybody on the boat, then we ask that the Supreme Court not let the boat go down. Please throw us a life preserver. I'll repeat that. If Governor Inslee cannot save everybody on the boat, then we ask that the Supreme Court not let the boat go down. We ask that you throw us a life preserver. Thank you for listening. Thank you so much, Jenny. Uh, our last speaker is going to be JJ, and JJ will speak from his own lived experience and continue to elaborate on some of the things that Jenny just shared. You're still muted, JJ. How's that? 
Okay, I wanted to, uh, I can directly speak to this, uh, the dichotomy that the governor is putting between violent and nonviolent offenders, because less than six months ago, I was in Washington State Reformatory, finishing a 27 year sentence uh, after being found parolable for a crime I committed at 14. And the crime I committed at 14 is a violent offense. Notwithstanding the fact that the Indeterminate Sentence Review Board found that I was not likely to reoffend, under the governor's order, I would still be there right now because I committed a violent crime. And the key is that by using language about nonviolent offenses, uh, the words he did not use was likely to recidivate because they have risk assessment tools in there to make those determinations. They've had independent bodies, whether it is the Indeterminate Sentence Review Board for people who are currently under parole or for individuals who have already been vetted by the, at a commutation hearing and were found releasable and they're just there waiting for the governor to sign that order. There are large classes of people in there who it has already been determined they do not pose a risk to public safety, yet they are excluded from this order because of the idea that what they did long ago is relevant with respect to what they will do now. Their risk assessments take all of that into consideration. And importantly, when we talk about everybody who's in a camp setting, I think it needs to be further emphasized that everybody there is getting out. Everybody who is in a camp setting has already been assessed to determine whether they can even be there because so many already work in the community while they're in camp. They go out and fight fires. They're on the side of the road. They're in the community right now. And the idea that some people who are working in the community in a camp have to sit there and have their lives at risk simply because of the nature of their long ago offense does not make any sense. And it's scary for me to think about this because it's so real to me because I just left that place not so long ago. And one of the individuals who's directly impacted was just found releasable by the Indeterminate Sentence Review Board. He's been locked up almost 30 years, Aries Falatogo. All they're waiting for is to approve his release plan. But in the 60 days it's going to take the department to go through that administrative process, his life is going to be at risk. And he is just one of countless other people that there is no rational basis for their lives to be put at risk. And the only reason they are being excluded from this release is because of fear. And it's an irrational fear because the studies show based upon their age and the amount of time that they have remained confined that they are the exact class of individuals you would want to release if public safety was the key. But we're not only talking about public safety, we're talking about public health and the fact that they are going to languish there and risk not only their lives, but the lives of others who have to be in contact with them, to the officers who have to work in these places where nobody can social distance, it's unacceptable. And that's why all of us are here today and we're hoping that there is some type of rational response that is going to be taken to this emergency. Thank you, JJ. Can you say and spell your full name as you would like uh, media to use it? It is Jeremiah, J E. R-E-M-I-A-H Bourgeois, B-O-U-R-G-E-O-I-S. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> so we're going to take some questions. You can uh, place those into the chat if you do have them. Uh, I also wanted to announce that starting at noon, there will be community actions happening at Monroe, the governor's mansion, and at Purdy. 
Uh, these will be social distanced actions, obviously following the order and wanting to protect our community, but also acknowledging that uh, without some significant community pressure, we are unsure that the governor and Department of Corrections will actually take the necessary steps to protect our loved ones. And so we will continue to find ways to show up, to support them, to um, ensure that their voice is heard and amplified. Um, if, there, if there are questions, please go ahead and put those in the chat. Allow a, a couple more seconds. Great. Thank you for being here with us. I do want to leave us with um, a quote from the governor that has stuck with me throughout this ordeal. And it was his uh, continuing to say that as a state, we will not tolerate any preventable deaths. And as far as our loved ones in the Department of Corrections go, their, their, their lives are valuable and meaningful. And any death caused by COVID-19 within that department is incredibly preventable. You've heard from family members, you've heard from Jeremiah, you've heard from public health experts, how we can ensure that our loved ones' lives are protected. And we expect that our governor make good on that promise, not just for Washingtonians that are not incarcerated, but for all Washingtonians, including uh, our loved ones that are incarcerated. Uh, there is a question as to whether or not the named plaintiffs will be released as of now. Uh, I do not have the answer to that and have not heard uh, whether or not that will happen. Uh, I recommend emailing Nick Allen and he will have uh, clarifications for that. Again, his email was N-I-C-K period A-L-L-E-N at ColumbiaLegal.org. And if there are no additional questions, we'll go ahead and uh, finish this press conference. We thank you for your time. It was recorded and it should be available online.